Rebecca for reminding me to hit record, which has now been done. I'd like to introduce Thane Joyal. Thane? Welcome. Hello. I'm going to confess right off the top of the bat that I am very accustomed to talking with my hands. And so I will be very grateful to you folks for using the question and answer uh, feature. Uh, just so I know that you're there. Um, as Mark said, my name is Thane Joyle. I'm one of the newer members of the CDF uh, Board Leadership Development Team. And with my colleague, Marshall Kovitz, I will be presenting tonight's workshop. Uh, generally, expect to hear me on the beginning introductory material and then on the end on the conclusion. And then here and there, just to make sure that you're awake. Um, as Mark mentioned, <clears throat> with John and Erica's support, um, uh, reminders, this is being recorded, which is a really useful feature if you have other board members who are not able to attend. I'd urge you to encourage them to use the recording to gather the information um, and keep up to date. I just want to thank Mark for incredible, fabulous technical support. Um, and creative advice uh, in the preparation of this program and just overall, and also acknowledge Marshall, who it is a true delight for me to work with. I am going to try to change slides, but as I found this morning, it is sometimes a little bit slow to respond for some reason. And my uh, thing, sometimes what I do is I click in the slide, and that way you know for sure that it's responding it's to... Thinking. Yeah, there you go. Understand what I'm in PowerPoint. <clears throat> so before we look into the nuts and bolts of tonight's topic, I just want to give you an overview of the Seabuild program, which as far as I'm concerned is one of the kindest programs um, ever designed for co-op boards. Because it is, it is designed to provide support to the board as a whole in as many different types of media um, as possible in order to sort of broadly provide support to the board um, wherever it finds itself. So the core, from my perspective, of the CEO program are the consulting hours that are designed to provide support to the board throughout the year. And those are used in a variety of ways, from one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of mentoring calls with the board president to specialized workshops and other kinds of uh, support that can be provided usually through the telephone. But in addition, uh, your Seabuild consultant offers a one-day retreat for the board each year. And a number of classes are offered as board orientation sessions called CBL 101, which is an in-person all-day training which has foundation material and uh, is invaluable not only for that, but also for the networking that can happen between members of different co-ops. Then the, the component that you already know about because you're here are the online courses. And this year there are two categories of classes. One is Mastering the Fundamentals, and the other is Thinking and Acting Strategically. I think the reason I refer to this as a really kind program is it acknowledges that part of the essential components of being a board member is active ongoing learning. And so I'm really delighted to be part of a series that recognizes um, that there are fundamental skills that we need to accomplish and acquire as board members, and that on an ongoing basis, um, we can grow those skills and develop them uh, to an active, um, well, to an art for those of us who have been doing it for a while. I want to say welcome. It's a wonderful thing to be talking to people from across the country all at once and across time zones. I want to thank you. It's not necessarily an easier and attractive thing to everybody to hang out in front of the computer screen on the telephone that can't hear your voice. Um, but it's tremendously valuable for all of us to be here together. And if I could just put one more plug in for the question and answer, um, please, do, please do chime in when necessary even when you don't feel so urgent, but just curious. So from my perspective, the most important outcome of this workshop 
is that all of us as board members become sensitized to situations that present legal issues that require consultation with an attorney. So I'll disclose that one of my other occupational um, activities um, is the practice of law, environmental law, which is completely separate and apart from my work for CDS, but it does give me certain um, brain quirks, if you will. Um, in law school, one of the most important things they taught us, certainly all they tested on the bar exam, as far as I could tell, was issue spotting. In other words, were you able to identify a potential problem or issue that posed legal risk? So while not every problem has a solution in the law, there are some areas that should be red flags to anyone who's a board member and should at least raise the question of whether an attorney should be, ex should be consulted. So the purpose of this workshop is not to substitute or provide legal advice, but to sensitize you to the times when it would be appropriate to call your lawyer. So on this slide, I've listed the tangible outcomes of the workshop. We're hoping to offer you a basic understanding of the roles and responsibilities the law imposes on board members. More important, we want you to be we want to be sure that you understand that it's relatively simple to fulfill these responsibilities. No exceptional skills are required to be an excellent board member. Finally, as I mentioned, we want to be sure that you know when you need legal advice. And of course we hope you never need it. So then here's a slide showing you the key points that we're going to cover in the workshop. Excuse me. In a moment, I'll go over with you the role of the board briefly, which is, in general, to govern the cooperative. After we take a minute to answer any questions that have come up so far, then Marshall will go into a review of the elements of the board's fiduciary responsibility. Fiduciary, in brief, is just a responsibility to hold the owner's assets in trust. It's a special relationship which can be fulfilled by attending to certain duties the duty of attention, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of care. And Marshall will go over each of these with you. I just want to remind you to distinguish, if you will, between this notion of responsibility and the concept of liability. So responsibility, to my mind, exists independently of the law. Liability, on the other hand, attaches from the legal system imposes consequences for the failure of a responsibility or duty. Now that sounds really boring. I have a responsibility to make sure that my nine pound mini Dachshund Rosa doesn't nick your ankle when you come in the door. But the law is not going to require me to compensate you for your injuries if a dog bites you, except under certain circumstances. Or you could say I'm only liable for the injury caused by the dog bite under those limited circumstances. It was my dog. I knew she was likely to bite or work. I trained her to bite you, and so on. So liability <clears throat> is different from responsibility, and it has a different purpose. And I make this distinction because I think it's common to conflate the two. And I think in order to um, manage the fear, which can come up sometimes in association with the prospect of being a board member, oh no, you know, I'm liable if anything goes wrong. Well, yes and no, right? The formation of the business entity, as I'll discuss in a minute, was created to, in effect, shield the directors from all but certain kinds of liability. And when that liability should be imposed, is tested by something called the business judgment rule that courts use that Marshall will talk to you about. All right, so what exactly is the cooperative? Is it people? Is it a place? I submit to you that in fact it's both and it's also neither. So a cooperative is a legal entity. It's a creation of state law. State business laws set forth the rules for creating a consumer cooperative and those same state laws set the rules for governing it. In general, these laws are at a fairly high level. They cover the stuff that lawyers make their livings off, the worst case scenarios, what happens in the event of dissolution, 
And they cover the stuff lawyers love, the wrenchingly boring stuff about what happens if the organization can't get a forum together to change its bylaws. And it covers everything in between. Now, once the cooperatives have been created by adoption of articles of incorporation, it becomes, in effect, a legal person. We could have a conversation about that, but we'll skip it for the moment. Short, you can think of the co-op as a little entity of its own, um, but it's an unusual person. It is created by a large number of member owners for whose benefit the cooperative was created, and it's governed by a special smaller group of member owners called the board of directors. So just to review the roles in a co-op. So the members own the co-op. The member owners elect the board to direct or govern the co-op on their behalf. The board hires the general manager to manage the co-op. And the general manager typically, almost always, hires staff to operate the store or the other enterprises that the co-op is conducting. And the staff serves the customers, many of whom are member owners. And then we could see the farmer and the gal, you know, the members on the co-op. So you see, it's circular in a sense. And this is one of the things that is distinctive about the cooperatives. Now, we're here, though, to talk about a particular group of individuals within the co-op. We're here to talk about the board. And this is a beautiful photograph that I could not resist using of folks at the Davis Food Co-op. And I'll be honest, I don't know folks at Davis, so I don't know if this is the board or not. But <clears throat> it's a wonderful image to remind us that the board is a group of people, and it's a special group of people, who are elected by the member owners to lead the cooperative. I want to make it very clear that anybody can be an effective board member. It's not uncommon to hear nominations committees thinking about the ideal skill mix for new nominees. Uh, we need a lawyer on the board. We need an accountant. You know what we really need? Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't. But most likely what you really need in a board member is someone with enough time to do a good job, someone who is attentive to group process, someone who is willing to prepare for meetings, willing to assume responsibility for group decisions, willing to learn, and to my mind, that means willing to be wrong, to be right, to not know which, and to be able to change their minds. So I just want to deal with you the basic principles of governance, because being an effective board member depends on remembering why the roles the title's gonna talk about apply at all in the first place. So as trustees, the board has a moral and legal responsibility to act as stewards, if you will, on behalf of others, member owners. And the board has the responsibility to speak as a group, to use good group process skills to ensure that it speaks with a voice that reflects the diversity of its membership. To do its job, the board needs to know how to delegate authority effectively, to protect owner values, to empower staff, and to be clear, never to double delegate. Finally, accountability is the most important thing that the board must provide. If there is no other point to take on, it's that accountability and documentation are key to excellence in governance. The board needs to ensure that the benefit that the member owners expect from the cooperative is provided by the cooperative. So what's the result? Well, excellence in governance, we would hope. Boards that lead into the future with vision. Boards that use their time well, that are efficient, and that value the contributions of all board members. Boards that are clear about their vision, that derive that vision by excellent linkage with their member owners and communicate that vision throughout the organization. And finally, boards that last. Boards that have a strong culture, that invites excellent new nominees year after year, and that rewards committed directors with the satisfaction of a job well done. No big deal. So, question: Does this point 
Thank you, Thane. Um, yeah, there's there's one, and and that is, could you please repeat the qualities or criteria that you listed off um, of of uh, good directors, and or could that list be made available um, in in print for us? Yes, in print for sure. And I'm flipping back through my notes. I think we can write that up, but. Where'd it go? It was a great list. Ah, uh, there it is. The attempted to group process list. The uh -huh. person who's willing to prepare for meeting. Yep. Willing to assume responsibility for group decisions. Willing to learn. So willing to be wrong and willing to change their mind. Nice. Thanks for that. And that was the one comment so far. Actually, let me take this opportunity to remind people that this is an interactive session. And we're using the go to webinar question and answer dialog box to field your comments and questions during the session. You can find it by clicking the little triangle next to the letter Q in the word question in the go to webinar tool, tool kit. And then underneath enter a question for staff, you can type it up and hit send. I'll be managing that uh, during the session. And when Thane and Marshall get to slides like this, they're looking forward to fielding your questions and comments. And back to you, Thane. I think it's over to you, Marshall. OK. Well, thank you very much, Thane. And I um, want to echo Thane's thanks to Mark <clears throat> for doing such a great job in um, putting the technical parts together and being just a marvel of support. Um, so what we're going to do now <clears throat> is look at the elements of the board's responsibility, the board's legal responsibility. And as Thane said, um, the board's responsibility is defined uh, primarily by state law and also by court cases. What we're going to do is present some of the commonly accepted standards. Um, these are standards that you'll very likely find in many state laws. However, it's important if you want more details and a better understanding. Um, that you check your own specific state law just for those details. So um, here are some of the common standards that you see in front of you. Uh, the duty of attention, duty of loyalty, duty of care. Um, now, assuming you adhere to the above three standards, what we'll do next is look at how your actions may be protected by the business, business judgment rule. And then finally, um, in the last part, Thane will discuss how the board can provide appropriate protection for individual board members in the form of insurance and indemnification. So um, let's get started on the list. And let's go next to the duty of attention diligence. What this means is that um, uh, to be attentive in diligence requires that you actively participate in the work of governance um, and that you are also, of course, aware of your legal responsibilities. It means attending meetings, being prepared, that is, reviewing all the materials before you come to meetings. It's very important if you don't understand something that you ask questions. Um, it's vital to participate in discussions. After all, it's the group process that allows us to be so effective in our governance. Um, delegate responsibly. That is, know uh, the qualifications of the people or the person, the single person in the board's case, to whom you're delegating. And of course, it's necessary to verify that the board expectations are met. Um, we write down our expectations and, and often have clear written expectations. But an important part of our work is also to ensure that those expectations are actually met. Now, here's another important part of our work in, um, in the duty of attention. We're going to be um, listening to others who have something to say about how the organization is being run, people to whom we've delegated some responsibility. Board members have a right to rely on written and verbal information presented by staff, by other board members, and by outside experts, as long as they have reason to believe that such sources are reliable. So for example, it's perfectly fine to um, rely on reports of our general manager, on committee reports, um, on reports and information submitted by experts, people like lawyers, accountants, and consultants. 
Um, um, another important aspect to the duty of attention is that you know and you adhere to all legal documents. Um, we, you know, we mentioned earlier we have a state law. Our co-ops are incorporated with articles of incorporation. We've written our own bylaws. We've written policies. Um, we also have prior board decisions and approved contracts. Um, all of those things are uh, important documents, and we've got to behave in a manner that's consistent with those documents. Sometimes we're not sure, and um, these are very, very technical issues at times. As Thane mentioned, it's really important that we be attuned to the notion of um, maybe it's time to consult an attorney. And um, finally, it's very, very important that we ensure the payment of all taxes. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. So um, we've, we've, we've put this issue in several times because it's so important. Um, OK, so now, um, having talked about this a little bit, we're going to um, have uh, go on to the next slide. And Thane is going to read you a question about a possible scenario. So what would you do in this circumstance? You missed the last board meeting. Something came up. But at the last board meeting, the general manager shared information about potential problems with having owners work in the store. Now, at this board meeting, the board president is calling for a vote on a proposal to suspend the owner labor program until more information can be gathered. What would you do? Um, OK. Well, um, let's look at the two. Um, let's look at all of the possible answers. Um, you could vote yes, you could vote no, you could abstain. Um, quite possibly, though, it depends. Um, um, you saw the issue on the agenda, so you reviewed the minutes from the last meeting in advance. Or perhaps you didn't have time to review the minutes, and so you just came cold. This is really the first time you've seen anything. Um, OK, so let's look at the first scenario. Let's say you saw the issue on the agenda, so you reviewed the minutes from the last meeting in advance. Well, assuming that the minutes adequately documented the information presented, it's probably OK to vote according to your judgment. So now let's look at the second scenario. Um, in this case, you really didn't have time to review the minutes. And as we said, you came in cold. Um, unfortunately, this is the first time you, you, you saw it. So probably in this case, because you really don't have the information you need to, uh, uh, to, to, to make a correct judgment, um, the answer in this case is, is abstain. You really don't have the information you need. Um, so um, having looked at that scenario, do you have any questions? Marsha, we have no questions so far. You may continue. Okay, thanks, if, Mark. Let um, me just give a little commercial. Uh, this is an interactive session, and we're encouraging you to use the box underneath Enter a Question for the Staff and just hit Send, and we'll be taking those every time that little slide comes up of Thane and Marshall. Back to you, Marshall. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, so what's the board's responsibility? Let's look now at the duty of loyalty. And let's go on to the next slide entitled Duty of Loyalty. Um, your duty as a board member is to act in the best interest of the co-op. That means not acting in your best interest or the interest of somebody else, but only in the best interest of the co-op. Um, it also means avoiding conflict of interest. So what's a conflict of interest? A conflict of interest arises when you have a personal interest in a decision you are making as a board member. Do you see the conflict there? You're supposed to be making it strictly on behalf of the co-op as a board member, but you may have a personal interest as well. That's what we call a conflict of interest. So if such a conflict of interest arises, the first thing you need to do is always disclose it. You should make it very, very clear what the nature of the conflict of interest is. Generally speaking, when a conflict of interest occurs, you should also remove yourself from both the discussions and the decisions regarding that issue. Um, in other words, when the issue arises, having told everybody that you, know, that you have this conflict, 
you simply don't participate in the decision making process. Pretty straightforward, I think. Let's look at several kinds of conflict of interest. Um, one is called self dealing, which is not allowed. Generally, self dealing is not allowed unless it's done at arm's length and you are treated just as anyone else. So let's look at an example of that. So suppose you grew um, produce in your backyard. You were a, a backyard gardener and you wanted to sell some of your produce to the co-op. And you also happen to be a board member. Um, well, what do you do? Well, um, it would be okay as long as it's, as, it's, as it's very clear that you're going to be treated exactly the same as any other local grower would be. So um, um, that would uh, perhaps mean disclosing to the board and disclosing to the general manager that you're both um, a board member, as everybody knows, and also going to be selling. But the important part is that when you go in um, to the produce department to sell, that you're treated exactly as everybody else would. Let's look at another example, um, conflict of interest, self-dealing. Um, self-dealing occurs when you learn of potential business opportunities through your work as a director. You may be in a line of business that's potentially one in which you can compete with the co-op. We'll look at um, uh, that example in just a second. Um, finally, it's vital that you maintain confidentiality regarding sensitive issues. As a board member, you will receive information about personnel issues, legal matters, and possible real estate transactions. In all of these cases, and quite likely others that, that, that may be identified as such, it's important to understand which issues should be kept confidential. So let's look at a case of conflict of interest and we'll go on to the next slide and Thane will ask the next question. So what would you do in this circumstance? You have a catering business and you're on the co-op board. At the last meeting, the general manager presented confidential information about a bid the co-op deli submitted for an event being conducted by Mighty Fine Inc., which is a prominent local business. And the GM noted that so far, Mighty Fine has approached only the co-op. Question, should you submit a bid to Mighty Fine? Okay. And what would you do? Let's look at some possibilities. Could you submit a bid undercutting the co-op? Well, if you learned what the co-op's bid was through your board work, you could not use this information to submit a lower bid, right? Because you got that information as a, as a, as a board member. Could you ask the GM to keep non-board related information out of her store report or his store report? Well, if the GM is already doing this, if, if, if the GM is doing this as a matter of course, it really wouldn't be right to ask the GM not to do this either. After all, you're, you're asking the GM to do this on your behalf because of your personal interest. So that wouldn't be appropriate either. Um, so the point of this scenario simply is that you can see um, that it would be inappropriate to use any confidential information that you acquire during a board meeting for personal gain. Um, so does, does that make sense? Any questions about that? We do have some questions. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, these are not exactly uh, a question relating to the last thing, but kind of catching up. Um, two of them are somewhat related, but I'll give them to you separately. Um, what if a board member is convinced that his or her position on an item is in the best interest of the co-op, even when the rest uh, or the majority of the board disagrees with that position? What would be the best way for a board to handle that kind of situation? So you have a director who's convinced that a certain uh, activity should take place, and, and yet the rest of the board is in disagreement. What recommendations do you have to handle that? So uh, maybe. I'll start if it's okay, and, and Thane will, will, um, will perhaps want to jump in as well. 
but I'll, I'll start by asking, I, I assume that, that this question isn't directly related to a conflict of interest, Mark, as you said, but it's really a question of how does the board process work and um, how are decisions made? And um, one possible way to answer that would be, of course, to you know to look at your at your bylaws to see if there are any requirements about how decisions are made in your bylaws. Um, after all, we do want to be aware of, of our legal documents. So, um, if your bylaws simply say something like um, uh, a majority of members voting um, in a quorum may make a decision, then we would keep in mind that we would want to discuss all the relevant aspects of the issues, make sure everybody is aware of those, those um, uh, aspects, and then call for a vote. Because most likely the issue does have to be decided, and so what we would hope to do would be to get all the information out front, have people um, uh, be clear that they understand this issue, and then vote appropriately. And is there anything you would recommend from the point of view of of uh, building uh, or creating a context for public appearance or board uh, board holism or unity on on a situation like that? Um, what what um, if 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 I see where you're leading, Mark? You're suggesting that that after after the vote has been taken, then um, regardless of any differences of opinion, the um, uh, holistic nature of the board is such that everybody agrees that that whatever the vote was, that the entire board will accept it. Is, is that what you were referring to, Mark? Yep. I think the questioner is also just getting to the point of, and 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 uh, so so how. Does that lead you to, you know, present the board's actions, you know, outwardly to the to the public? Well, the board speaks with one voice, right? Mm -hmm. So, this is the this is the important part about the process. I guess what I'd like to add to what Marshall observed is that yes, you look at the bylaws to see what the process is, but also look at the policies and think about, you know, what are the board process policies? What has everybody agreed to? Um, is you know, are you guys, you know, following Robert's rules in voting? Are you using a consensus process? Whatever the process is, it's most important to preserve the integrity of that process um, because everybody is in, count is in the final analysis accountable for the decisions that the group makes. And we care very much in our society about how those decisions are made. We care a whole lot less, to be honest with you, about whether or not they're right or wrong. They need to be reasonable. But reasonable and right, as we unfortunately know, are not always necessarily the same. Or we don't know at the time we're making the decisions what's right and what's wrong. You know, the premise of the question is, you know, the board member is sure that they are right. And I now recognize in myself the sneaking feeling when I am most positive that I know the answer to a question and that I am correct. It's this little bell in my head goes off now, and I know that there's a good chance that I'm absolutely wrong. <laughs> um, and and it's so that's the point of group process because in that group we can do some true thing, right? We can come to understand better, you know, what is the issue actually that's being addressed? You know, what is the underlying concerns here? What are the things that are unstated in that certainty of being right? And is there an issue that the board actually is failing to acknowledge and failing to deal with? All of that needs to be taken part of part of the process for that to be a sense of holism and an, a willingness to accept the decision as it's you know even if, if it comes out and it's the quote unquote wrong answer. Right. Oh, thanks, Dane. And then I think that ideally the board would be able to um, write up its process or t be able to talk about that good process to uh, uh, to the community or to the members, et cetera, to kind of close that that uh, that topic out. So let me give you another oh, one. Good. Yeah. Um, so going back to the um, the first scenario that you had, um, Marshall, um, uh, the question is, how do you demonstrate that you're dealt with as quote unquote any other grower, what evidence or data would need would be necessary to assure that no self-dealing has occurred? Well, um, 
you know, let's 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 go back to that to that to that scenario. So, um, say for the sake of argument that the growers um, would normally deal with um, um, uh, with the produce manager, and the produce manager talks to the individual growers personally, individually, and makes decisions on the basis of what they have to offer and and uh, how much. So um, probably what uh, you know, one possible way to handle it um, could be to simply um, have the board member go in just as anybody else and. Um, negotiate with the uh, with the produce manager just as just as anybody else. Now, let's say that the produce manager um, would recognize the grower as a board member and wonder if, um, as a result of this person's being the board person, if she or he is entitled to some special privilege. Under those circumstances, it would probably be appropriate to notify the um, the, the produce manager. That, uh, that that this board person is not indeed entitled to any special privileges and must be treated exactly as everybody else. So that might be one way to handle it. Um, um, looking looking at it from uh, another point of view, um, it would be appropriate to you know to to ensure that that happened. And let's say you know we hope this doesn't happen, but if the if the the, the board person pro uh, a grower. Also insisted on some special special privilege because of his or her status, then it would be entirely appropriate for the um, for the produce manager to report this to the general manager, who would then in turn report it to the board. So that that would be those could be a couple of ways in which the the scenario of you know of, of ensuring that kind of arm's length dealing might might occur. Thane, do you want to? Add something to that? Well, maybe could I just jump in and, and just throw in a couple of extra extra credit follow up questions? Um, one is if they have a code of conduct uh, policy, how would monitoring that uh, code of conduct policy come into play? And then uh, lastly, since many of these kind of ethical uh, problems or relationships kind of occur, you know, between individuals. And may not be readily apparent. Um, how how you know do you assure? Uh, how does the board you know move forward with confidence that the uh, it, any issues like this are actually you know being dealt with appropriately? Disclosure and documentation. So of course we have excellent board process policies, or we have a system in place for you know self monitoring. Um, that provides the board a regular opportunity to to look at and review and disclose whether or not there are any conflicts. It's not uncommon for some boards to open their meetings um, in the early part of the agenda and you know clear conflicts um, and provide a routine space for people to acknowledge if any have arisen since the last meeting. Um, but it's possible also to deal with that through correspondence. It is important to leave a paper trail, no matter what you choose to do. Okay, and I have I have uh, switching over to a different topic. Um, in in the um, case of the voting yes no abstain, um, if there's an issue uh, before the board that requires a supermajority in order to carry the motion, and a director chooses to abstain from the vote, how does their um, how is their uh, how is that counted? Is it is it as if the person wasn't there? Or, um, or, or just how how is that handled? Gosh, you know that sounds like a legal issue to me that I'm not sure I'd want to try to. It's going to depend on how the bylaws are written. Um, it's going to depend on how the bylaws are written because usually that the language that creates the supermajority is fairly specific, um, and sets out. You know, it'll say. You know, this percentage of board members attending vote in the affirmative. Well, okay, so you're attending, but you didn't vote in the affirmative, so you're part of the quorum base amount, you the abstaining director, um, in which case, you know, count. Um, so really important to go back to those original documents in order to answer that question. It depends. 
and then maybe after they figured it out the first time, they'd want to write it down so they wouldn't have to figure it out every time. <laughs> Although, how often is it going to happen? We hope it's not going to come up that often. Exactly, yeah. Okay, your bylaws ought to be in the binder that you bring to every board meeting anyway. Okay, and that is all the questions for the moment, so let's keep going. Okay, so what is the board's responsibility? Let's look now at the duty of care. And what does the duty of care mean? Duty of care is making decisions in good faith. And good faith means that you sincerely believe that you are making decisions with appropriate information in the best interest of the co-op. However, if you have information that suggests otherwise, then you are not acting in good faith. So for example, um, you are ordinarily allowed to accept reports from, um, from the management and from officers and from committees. But if you know something that any, uh, if you know something about any of those people <coughs> um, that suggests for one reason or, or another they're unreliable, then you're not acting in good faith um, if you accept their report. So perhaps, for example, um, a committee has not in the past presented um, reliable information. If you're getting a report again, then um, um, you may want to question them hard, and you may want to ask yourself, is this information that we can really trust? Um, if you simply pass on it and accept it, knowing um, that in the past there have been problems, well, that, that may be a problem for you as well. So what is a prudent person? A prudent person is something that we'll look at in more detail in just a minute. We're going to do that in the next slide, actually. Um, using a good process for decision making is important because, as we will see later, the courts are interested not only in what the decision was, but just as Thane said, it's really important how the decision was made. Was it made hurriedly or was it made using a good process in which all the important issues were examined? Um, needless to say, it's really important to be honest and um, it's vital, as Thane has already said, to ensure that adequate records are kept. You want to be able to clearly document the decision and the process used. So um, let's go back now to in some detail and look at the prudent person. Um, so if you don't happen to be looking at your screen right now, it's worth just flashing back and going back and checking out the slide, because I don't know where you found this image. Um, Mark, but it's an awesome image. And my dad is, well, I hope it's somewhere from an image from somewhere in the U.S. But the question of what's reasonable and what's prudent, this slide actually demonstrates a really important concept, which is it depends. It depends on the circumstances. So here you can see that the law is actually telling you that for trucks and at night for all vehicles, 65 is the speed limit. That's what's reasonable and prudent. But during the day, it's variable. It depends on circumstance. What if it's foggy? What if it's snowing? What if it's bright, sunny, and the pavement is dry? What's reasonable and prudent? It's going to depend on the circumstances. Okay, and exactly the same said, Reasonable and prudent is dependent on the circumstances. Um, reasonable and prudent doesn't mean that you have to be correct, but it does mean that you should have used a reasonable process. And once again, this is the, this is an important issue that that Thane and I have have raised again and again. The process is really vital. Um, prudent does not mean doing nothing because sometimes we have to act, even if we act with incomplete information. So um, when we decide if it's reasonable, we want to look at the circumstances under which the decision was made. Um, how complex was the decision? Um, are the time and resources devoted to, to the decision commensurate with the complexity? Did we spend enough time with the difficult issue? Were we able to examine it in all its complexity? Did we have all the appropriate documentation and information? Um, what is the um, ex exigency under which it was made. As I just said, sometimes circumstances are urgent, and that's perfectly okay. Um, we may be required to make an immediate decision, 
even if we can't get all of the information that we want. Um, so under some circumstances, um, reviewing some information uh, would probably be regarded as prudent, whereas um, possibly under different circumstances with more time allowable, it might not be considered so prudent. Once again, it depends. Um, we also have to look at what kind of information was available at the time. Was it adequate? Was it trustworthy? So let's now look at the next slide and talk a little bit about um, a definition of a, a reasonable, prudent person. And here's a, here's a definition. Um, uh, a, a, a reasonable and prudence are those qualities of attention, knowledge, intelligence, and judgment which society requires of its members for the protection of their own interests and the interests of others. This phrase does not apply to a person's ability to reason, but to the prudence with he or she acts under the circumstances. So that gives you an idea of what, you know, what the definition of a prudent person is. You can see um, here, too, that we're not talking about hard and fast rules. Once again, uh, very often we're going to see it depends. So let's look now at the next slide. Um, let's look now at the business judgment rule. Um, this is an important legal protection. And um, we'll go to the, um, um, the, 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 the um, OK, yep, we're, we're, we're right there. Um, the business judgment rule um, is one of several different protections the board has. Um, we'll also look at these other issues as a means of providing protection, um, keeping accurate records, ensuring timely payment of taxes, utilizing insurance and indemnification. So now, um, let's go back to the business judgment rule and go to the next slide. OK. Directors have the legal right to rely on the advice of those who can reasonably be assumed to be reliable. Directors making the decisions on an informed basis in good faith using a reasonable process will likely be protected regardless of the adverse consequences resulting from the decision. So um, this rule really recognizes the fact that the future is uncertain. We rarely, if ever, can make decisions with perfectly complete information. In short, as we all know, business involves taking risks. But it's OK to take risks. As a matter of fact, it's really necessary to take risks in the business world as long as they're reasonable. OK, so let's go on to the next slide. Keeping accurate and adequate records. Board meeting minutes are the primary source of information about how the board does its job. So the minutes are also the means by which you demonstrate that your decision-making process is consistent with the legal duties we just discussed. In other words, you want to just show how uh, the kind of process you went through in making the decisions. Because as we've said repeatedly by now, the process means an enormous amount. It's really vital that you demonstrate a good process. Um, and that's an important reason why your minutes should accurately reflect your decisions and process. Um, one of the things that we know from previous court cases involving directors' legal roles is that in deciding whether a board was fulfilling its role, the court looked not only at the nature of the, de the decision, but how the decisions were made. If it was a complex decision, um, um, you know, did people take the time? Did people review the appropriate documents? Was it a good process in which um, all the different possibilities were discussed? And let's um, go to the next slide. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, a note on taking minutes. Um, minutes are the record uh, of the board's deliberations. The minutes should not be verbatim transcripts. Minutes should be concise and accurate. All important decisions should be documented. All documents relied uh, on by the board should be referenced and preferably attached. So minutes should be archived and be completely accessible. And then finally, um, uh, let's go to the, to the um, last slide in this section. And we've talked about this several times already, ensuring that uh, uh, the payment of all tax obligations. The reason that this is so important 
is that directors can be held personally liable for unpaid taxes. And uh, no board member certainly wants to go through that. That's why it's so vital that, um, that the board ensure that all tax obligations are paid. So, um, um, any questions? Well, we have a couple. And also, we'll just remind people to use the GoToWebinar Enter a Question for Staff box to send them in. We've got a couple here to get things going. Um, one is a definition. Marshall, you used the word... I think it was exigency, and uh, the question is, what is exigency? The, the the urgency of the of the decision. You know, sometimes you have to make decisions very quickly, and so um, I probably should have used a, a term like urgency rather than exigency. Okay. But when you have a lawyer working with you, you kind of get stuck with these things sometimes, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a fun, it's a fun word, too, isn't it? It's, yeah, exactly, especially if you know what it means. Um, <laughs> the other is, is, uh, is, is more of a, uh, of a concept question. Uh, you were really um, enforcing the idea that it's about good process. So the question was, how does a group get good at good process? Practice. Practice, 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 and pay attention. So knowing what the process is that you've agreed to is important, right? Clarity and transparency um, and active participation. But it doesn't necessarily come naturally. Group process is something that for some people is extremely easy and for other people um, it's not the most natural skill. We are social beings. We're complicated creatures. So group process is a really cool opportunity <clears throat> to get to know not just other people, but one's own self. And engaging in group process, frankly, is it's a little self-exposing. It's dangerous, but it's exciting in that way that dangerous activities are. So practice is one way to make the dangerous activity safer. Um, and it's fun. And, and I would add to that, um, not only practice, but finding people who had lots of experience doing that and people whom you consider reliable, um, um, who can help you with it. So that you, you, know, you want to rely on practice and you also want to be able to build on other people's experience and learning. Um, you know, uh, CDS consultants, for example, would be, would be people right, that was, who probably yeah. rely on. That was why I described the CBIL program as a kind program because um, group process, as I said, isn't necessarily easy. Um, but there are people who know how to do it, and there are skills, techniques, if you will, to use that ensure that it goes better. Um, All right, thanks. And at the moment, those are our only two questions. We do encourage you to send in your comments and questions as the presentation continues. And we are coming to the close of the really substantive information that we wanted to uh, present to you tonight. Um, but I just want to cover just a couple of, of protective mechanisms, if you will. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is indemnification. That's one of those wonderful words. Because it's important to acknowledge, and I know this is going to shock you, although Someone asked a question earlier that makes me think that perhaps you won't be surprised to acknowledge that not everybody is going to agree with every decision the board makes. We would hope most of the board members agree with most of the decisions that the board makes, but there will be people in the member owner group that won't necessarily agree. And so in the event of serious worst case scenario disagreement, um, there are often a need for other mechanisms to provide additional protection to the board members. Remember that the creation of the cooperative, of the legal entity, provides a tremendous shield for the board members. In general, as long as the board member is complying with the business judgment rule, in other words, is acting as a reasonable and prudent board member, is attending to his or her duty of care, all will be well. But in the event that there is litigation, 
or there is another circumstance in which um, recovery of cost is sought um, as a result of somebody's service as a director. Indemnification is intended to provide reimbursement. So in a worst case scenario, indemn indemnification could be available to cover attorney fees and other litigation related expenses in the event that a lawsuit were brought. Please note that the bylaws driven by state law both usually dictate the circumstances under which indemnification is available. Note that the co-op is not going to have to reimburse the director for costs that the director incurs because of actions that the director takes which are in bad faith, which are criminal, um, which constitute some other kind of misconduct that will be set forth in state law. In general, indemnification, as long as a board member is acting in good faith, will be available. That's pretty much what I want to say about indemnification, but I'd be curious to hear from folks on the call whether or not you've ever seen a situation where uh, you've needed to use your indemnification clauses. The other thing I would love to hear from participants about um, is whether or not you obtain um, insurance for your directors and officers. Insurance is available, um, and many co-ops do choose to purchase it. Um, I would say that I'm not in any sense an expert in insurance coverage, but I will note that it's very important whenever purchasing any form of liability insurance, read the fine print. Be sure that you know what you're buying and think about the terms of the policy and the types of behavior that you want to insure, of course, without encouraging careless performance. That's all I want to say about those two, but I would really hope um, that some of you have some experiences of your own to share, either concerning indemnification or insurance. Well, I don't know that I hope that you do from a selfish perspective because I'd like to learn something. But truly, I think these are mechanisms of last resort, um, that it should be extremely rare that anyone needs to use them, and they should mostly be there as reassurance. So thanks, Dane. We do have a couple of, of questions following up on, on that content. Uh, one, I guess, is a clarification question uh, regarding indemnity and and how it comes into being. Um, is it through uh, state law, bylaws, policy, and exactly what is indemnity's relationship with uh, insurance? Okay, so both concepts are important, right? Indemnification as a principle is probably set up in the state law that creates the kind of business entity that that um, you are as a co-op. And we know that co-ops are incorporated as all kinds of different flavors of legal entities, if you will. Um, but typically, that law will set out the conditions under which directors may permissibly be indemnified. Because remember, the goal of those business formation laws is to protect the member owners who form the organization. So we don't want the organization to have to reimburse bad directors, I mean bad in the sense of criminally bad. Um, directors acting in good faith. So to protect them, state law is going to narrowly prescribe when indemnification is available at all. Now, um, it's not uncommon for, um, but not necessarily wise in the bylaws, to restate that state law provision. Might be fine. Might not be necessary. Might be helpful more to have it in the board policies, in the board, you know, packet as a point of information that it does exist. Um, it might also be that it's a matter that the board wishes to address in the policy in some fashion. For example, there may be a broader universe of indemnification allowed under the state law than the cooperative wishes to permit. And whether that decision is made at the bylaw level or the policy level is going to partly depend on where the state law left the power. And if it left the power with the member owners, then that decision is going to have to be made through the bylaws. If, on the other hand, the board reserves some of that power to you know, decide for itself what conduct of its members um, is subject to indemnification, that's fine. Now, insurance is a gap filler, to my mind, because in the event that there is litigation, for example, um, costs are likely to be incurred. 
and it is not necessarily a bad idea for the co-op to have insurance as an entity that will allow it to be made whole in the event that it incurs costs defending a director who, you know, acted in good faith or a group of directors who acted in good faith and who are the target of litigation, which, you know, may not be necessarily well-founded. I know that's another shocking concept. Um, but nonetheless, defense costs are real. And so that's where insurance is available as a gap filler. So the... Um... So if you were to uh, ask the why or why not question regarding having insurance as opposed to just relying on indemnification alone, how would you characterize that? that uh, well, so indemnification, indemnification for me as a board member means that the co-op is going to cover the costs that I incur defending myself for that decision the board made when I knew I was right and they voted the other way anyway. Okay? I'm joking. But you get the idea. On the other hand, the um, organization, when it pays my legal fees, takes a hit. It suffers a loss. So the organization might consider having insurance to cover that, either by insuring me as a board member, then there's no need to indemnify me because I haven't suffered a loss. My legal fees were paid. I've made whole. Um, or by ensuring the cooperative against those kinds of losses. Okay. Thanks. Um, so the next two questions are a whole different topic. Ready for a different topic? Um, and they are about minutes. Um, the first question is minutes. Who should be able to see them? How long should they be kept and where? Anyone forever, and it depends. <laughs> Anyone forever, and it depends. <laughs> Actually, not forever. But state law will probably tell you how long corporate records have to be kept. What do IRS re regulations, I think, require tax records to be kept for seven years? Uh -huh. That's a reasonable benchmark. Um, and it's a point, it's a good note, actually, that it's not necessarily a crazy idea for a co-op to have a records retention policy um, that just goes through the different kinds of records that the co-op has and indicates how long they have to be kept. For example, there are certain kinds of membership records that actually you do need to keep forever. Meeting minutes? Hmm. It depends. In general, I think it's wise to have an archive of them going back to the beginning of the co-op if possible. Okay. Does that mean that they have to be up on the co-op's webpage? Nah. But they should be accessible to as wide a range of people as possible unless they're, they're dealing with sensitive or confidential issues. And that's important to note that there are some things, personnel matters, for example, concerning the GM, are the kind of things that should be addressed in executive session. It would be appropriate for the minutes to note that the discussion took place but it wouldn't be appropriate to share the content of that broadly. On the other hand, it might be important for the board as a record of its deliberations, particularly in a difficult and sensitive personnel matter, to thoroughly document what went on in that executive session. But then that would be the responsibility of the um, board to retain and not to share. And two follow-up questions to that. So um, there's no need to, that. so the, the minutes would be, could be available to um, anyone, whether a member or not a member of the co-op? You know, I was speaking in general to the member ownership. Okay. Um, and, and the question of outside the owners, um, is a culture question and a legal question. There's a legal question of whether or not it's required. Um, and my bet is that generally state law, law isn't going to require sharing those minutes outside the member owners. Now, on the other hand, um, depending on the type of entity, depending on the culture of the organization, it might be desirable because, of course, transparency is one of the you know, foundations of 
the cooperative principles, and I took the cooperative principle slide out of this presentation. I knew it was in there for a reason. Um, but it does seem that as a practice point, many co-ops will probably want to have them available, whether or not someone is a, a member owner or not. And um, uh, and how are uh, other documents like monitoring reports from the manager or other other documents that the board uses during its uh, I doing its work uh, different from uh, minutes in terms of um, having them accessible to non-board members? Well, if the board's relying on them, they're not different. They are part of the record, part of the archive, um, and need to be um, need to be kept because, of course, in the event the board does need to justify a decision in a court, for example, it's going to need to be able to show not just the minutes of its deliberations, but the documents it relied on in making those deliberations. So if it's relying on monitoring reports, if it's relying on data that's submitted to support those monitoring reports, it all needs to be available. And would you say that would also be true in just the normal day-to-day you know, operations or in the case that you, in, in your example of, you know, if a decision was legally challenged, I mean, would the, I guess what the, the question is about, um, you know, for example, let's say specifically monitoring reports provided from the GM to the manager, um, how are those dealt with in terms of public or member access? Access and disclosure is a different question from retention, right? Right. So, so we're acknowledging that we need to retain them. The question of whether or not, you know, they're subject to disclosure, in general, you know, that same, you know, transparency rule applies. But, again, if there's confidential, sensitive information, information that, you know, transmitting to the ownership at large is going to compromise the business position of the co-op or jeopardizes somebody's um, personal confidential information. Um, that needs to be redacted. It needs to be blacked out um, in any version of that document that's shared outside the board. Um, and then the board needs to, of course, keep a copy of it with the sensitive information in um, and available. Cool, but in general, you know, I don't know. In general, I think you can't err by um, going for transparency wherever possible. To, to um, 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 amplify a little bit um, on what Payne said um, regarding retention policy, I've, I've seen situations in which boards ask that question specifically to their attorneys, and their attorneys came back with, with very explicit um, recommendations about how long to retain certain kinds of documents. You know, for example, real estate documents should be <clears throat> um, retained indefinitely. Um, minutes um, um, could be retained according to at least one attorney's advice I saw for as little as three years. Um, personnel, uh, personnel decisions might be retained longer. So um, I guess the reason I bring this up is because another source of information about a retention policy could very well be your attorney. Mm -hmm. And one last question <laughs> on minutes, and that is um, where might one find an example of good minutes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marshall? <laughs> um, gosh, I wonder. I wonder if, if anybody has um, a good definition. Of, of what good good minutes are, aside from the from the um, from the decision, sometimes um, people will. Uh, uh, I'd say that it's that you definitely don't want to include lots of details. You don't want to say um, who said what or what kind of an argument may have broken out. Um, it's probably appropriate to list the issues that this, that were discussed and describe the process, the other documents that were reviewed, and to then um, note the decision that was made. Would you agree with that, Thane? Yes. 
Yeah. And, and, and yet the question is, where can someone find an example? Call up the best board president, you know. Ask we, your C-Build ask, ask consultant. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that we should be thinking about uh, looking for as a resource and uh, adding to the resource list for this um, for this workshop. That's I'm sure we idea. can find a couple of good examples. Mm -hmm. And the and that is the extent of the questions on hand. Well, then let's move into putting this into practice and talking about how how all of this comes together. Because at the outset, we said that the board's goal is excellence in governance. Understand your role, do your homework, participate actively. Create a board culture that fosters excellence, amplifies deliberation, transparency, and vision. I put the governance principles up here again to inspire you. See yourselves as trustees. Learn to participate in group process. Let your voice be heard. Listen actively, change your mind, then change it again. But still, all the while, hold fast to your principles and listen, listen, listen. Delegate authority. And finally, be accountable. Just a special note on policy governance. If you use the system, use it well. Properly drafted and implemented policies will ensure that the board fulfills its duty. I'm just going to pause for a second and let you look at the slide. So let's just review the key points that we talked about. The board is responsible for leading the co-op. The board has a fiduciary responsibility. It holds owner assets in trust. It is important to fulfill that responsibility by maintaining right relations with the co-op. Be attentive. Disclose conflicts where they arise. Avoid them if possible. <laughs> and exercise your duty of care. Be reasonable. Be prudent. I talked to you some about a variety of things, but most important, remember that the business judgment rule is going to be the test for whether or not a director should be held liable. And I distinguish liability from when the legal system is going to impose consequences for a failure of duty. If you take nothing else home, from the do's and don'ts. Make sure the co-op pays its taxes. Make sure that's something that the board is monitoring. Make sure it knows the answer to that question. Remember, the reason for all this attention to detail is so that the board governs effectively on behalf of its member owners. That's pretty much the material we wanted to cover with you tonight. We can add a little time for questions before we close, but the last thought I want to leave you with from the, from the lecture <laughs> portion is please don't stop learning. There are more distance learning workshops that are related to this topic. There's one on acting on GM monitoring reports that's up on the website already. There's one coming up on, in September on understanding the balance sheet. Uh, and there's one in October on understanding member needs and motivations. Very important to keep learning um, and to use all of the resources that are available. In addition to the resources on the slide, there's no end in any bookstore of any decent size of excellent materials about the process of governance. And don't forget that your strongest resource of all is a phone call away, and that's your CBUILD consultant. I'm not kidding. There's no such thing as a silly question. So are there questions at this point before we close? No, Thane, but I would I would uh, add uh, a, a commercial message that on July 9th, there's a webinar on including members in the ENDS dialog, which will be very much about that vision aspect you uh, had there on that one slide. And on July 22nd, there's a session on recruiting and orienting new directors, which was very much related to your um, your work tonight. There's uh, one and one thank you from uh, for uh, 
well-structured and informative presentation. Well, I want to add one large thank you. Um, and please stay in touch. There's an evaluation form that's going to pop up on the screen after we end tonight. Um, please fill it out. Please let us hear from you and let us know um, how we are or aren't addressing your needs and what else, what other feedback you can offer us. Okay, well, Mark, thank, Mark. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thane and Marshall. Thank you. We'll stop now and and uh, that survey will come right up on your screen. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you all.